Thank you. Uh, I think the last time I was under a spotlight with a microphone in front of me, I was saying, Johnny, be good at a friend's wedding. So uh, <laughs> this is a little different. Um, my name is Phil Degnan. I'm the executive director of an organization called the State Commission of Investigation. It's a small watchdog investigative agency in Trenton. I will not embarrass myself by asking you to raise your hand if you've heard of us. Uh, but in, in a way, that's the way we like it. I'll tell you a little bit about the agency and then explain why I'm here. Um, we were created back in 1969 after Life magazine ran a series of articles about how the, uh, the mob, traditional organized crime, had infiltrated state government um, on a local and, and larger level. At that time, there was no uh, strong centralized state law enforcement department. There was no division of criminal justice. Um, so a commission was put together uh, to deal with uh, organized crime, which couldn't be investigated on a local level because they had infiltrated many local uh, police departments and municipalities. Um, so we were created out of that to, to deal with organized crime, and we were given an extraordinary uh, uh, power. We have subpoena power, so we can compel the production of documents and testimony, um, but we were given a, 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 an authority that's slightly different from what traditional law enforcement does. Rather than uh, investigate specific criminal acts and prosecute those cases, we were charged with looking at statewide systems um, that these criminal elements had infiltrated and making recommendations to the governor and the legislature as to how those systems could be changed so it would become harder for um, for those folks to profit from. And we did that, and we did it pretty well for a long period of time, but we were also given a much broader uh, mandate beyond looking at organized crime and public corruption. We were also given the authority to investigate any matters that uh, have an impact on the, the administration of justice in the state uh, and public safety in the state. I can fit pretty much anything under that umbrella if I want to, and so one of the things we started to do a couple of years ago was to look at a, a current trend um, that, that we became aware of out of another investigation, and the, the trend is, is what uh, Officer Kibbett was just talking about, which is this connection between prescription pill abuse and heroin in New Jersey. Um, with me today I have Chad Lackey, he's an attorney from my office. Uh, for the last few years he has been the driving force behind this, what I think is an extraordinarily important investigation. Um, that resulted in a public hearing a few years ago and a published report uh, that, uh, that addresses this issue. So I'm going I'm to talk about those and Chad is here to correct me if I foul anything up. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we discovered anything new. Um, we probably collected information that you've been aware of for a long time, that people in the treatment and prevention community have been aware of for a long time. But what we're able to do as an agency is to collect evidence and put it forward in a public setting and try to create a spark that generates a larger movement to address an issue that we think needs to be addressed. So in 2009-2010 we started to look at uh, what we started to call and what I believe to be very true the, the epidemic of prescription pill abuse in New Jersey. Um, as Officer Kivett just said, if, if you don't think you have a problem in your community, you're wrong. Um, and what was one of the things that was very startling to me and very startling to us uh, as we looked into this was the number of schools that we went to and talked to uh, representatives of the school who told us flat out, no, we don't have a prescription pill problem in our school. We have kids who drink, a couple who smoke pot, uh, but nothing beyond that. They're wrong. The statistics show that they're wrong. The treatment, the, the admissions data from treatment centers shows that they're wrong. And for me as a parent, that's terrifying uh, because I want people to be aware uh, of, of what's going on. So we, for the last few years, have been committed to trying to increase awareness. And in, in 2010, we held a public hearing, um, and, and, and I want to highlight just some of the, the facts that came out from this. Now again, I'm probably going to tell you things that you already know and have known for a long time, but in terms of collecting this data in one place and presenting it to legislators and the governor and asking them to make changes, um, that had not really been done before in, in, an organized, in, in an organized setting with a state agency behind it. So, you know, one of the things that we talked about, and, and you raised a minute ago, this, this problem defies the typical the stereotypical notion of what a 
uh, drug user is. Um, you know, people think of heroin, you know, growing up you thought of heroin as this sort of back alley uh, drug. It, it's, it's not that anymore. I, I don't know if it ever was that, but, but it, it's a much larger problem than that. Uh, and, and, and we tried to highlight that. Prescription pills are complicated. Uh, they are a legal substance. They do have positive effects for people's lives. Uh, but they are abused in devastating ways, and that's largely because these opiate prescription pills chemically are virtually identical to heroin. That presents a very specific problem in New Jersey. New Jersey is a point of entry in the United States for heroin. Our heroin is cheaper, has higher purity levels, and is more widely available than almost anywhere else in the country. The numbers, are, the, the purity levels in New Jersey are, it's, it's startling. Um, and I won't go into the, 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 the reasons for that, but, but largely because we're the first stop for a shipment of heroin in New Jersey. So what happens is prescription pill, kids start abusing prescription pills. That becomes addictive, it becomes very expensive. When you can't afford the pills anymore, and you start to go through withdrawal, and feel the sickness that you feel from an opioid withdrawal, the solution to that is to find a $7 bag of heroin that you can get by sending a friend a text message, picking up the phone. You don't have to drive anywhere to get it anymore. It gets delivered to your house now. And it's cheaper than a pack of cigarettes. And that makes you feel better. Um, I'm not qualified to, to talk much about treatment and prevention, and I'm also you know, not qualified really to talk about addiction, but the stories that we heard through the course of this uh, public hearing, the bravery that the kids that testified in front of our panel uh, demonstrated was, was incredible and, and devastating. I mean, 11 years old, starting prescription pills because a family member gave them to you, stealing them out of your parents' medicine cabinet, and then hooked on heroin at 14, rehab, jail. It, it's it's to, to think that, you know, another issue that we, that we dealt with was this idea, well, we do, do schools would tell us, well, we do a lot of drug prevention programs in high school. That is too late. It's too late. 11 years old. You can get, you, you know, thousands of dollars in Schedule II drugs are in your medicine cabinet at home right now. Uh, and, and the fact that there's not more security, uh, that we don't pay attention to that is, is, is really tragic. Um, so we had, we had this public hearing, and, and we, we, we tried to highlight this, this problem, and then as we talked about it internally, we felt like there was more that we could do. We're a quasi-law enforcement agency, so we sort of skewed towards the, the law enforcement. Um, that's where our expertise is. We looked at what kinds of law enforcement initiatives were taking place around the state, and realized that there just weren't a lot of prosecutions being done on a high level dealing with prescription pills. And we started to ask, why? Now, a lot of that is because people who use them, particularly young people who use them, get them out of a medicine cabinet, and that's virtually impossible to prosecute. But when we started to look at the larger scale distribution network, we noticed that these pill mills that operate around the state were not getting taken down at a level that we felt they should be taken down at. And there's a reason for that. There's a legitimate reason for that. They're hard cases. It's not your typical drug case. It's not a, a buy and bust type of situation when you're trying to take down a pill mill. You have a medical doctor with a license, with a white coat, with an office, with a staff that are, have the, the right and the ability to write prescriptions for legitimate purposes, but some of them, not all of them, the overwhelming majority of doctors are, great, are very good people, some of them have crossed the line from a legitimate medical professional to essentially a drug dealer. So we followed up our public hearing with a report where we tried to deconstruct what a pill mill looked like with the hope that uh, law enforcement people, prosecutors' offices would look at this and start to identify facts that they could investigate uh, in their towns that would allow them to put a viable criminal prosecution together. And we found a couple of of examples of, of doctors in New Jersey that we that, that we highlighted in our report, and, and I just want to give you some of the some of the numbers. And the, the report's available on our website. I, I, I did not bring copies because I, I try not to 
kill trees if I can avoid it. But um, uh, but if you Google New Jersey State Commission of Investigation, you'll see our website and you can read the report. We had a, we had a doctor with Russian organized crime connections uh, that took Medicare and Medicaid for oh, about a million and a half dollars over a pretty short period of time, basically by sending vans to homeless shelters um, to, to pick up people with uh, government uh, health programs and, and would write them prescriptions and then bill Medicaid and Medicare uh, for, for those. Uh, appointments lasting minutes, uh, no legitimate exams. Uh, actually, the doctor's office had a bouncer, uh, which I'd never never heard of before. And in a 19-month period, this particular doctor wrote 2,600 prescriptions for only for government-insured patients, 90% of which were for Endoset, Oxy, and Roxasta. Uh, he was the third-ranked doctor in New Jersey. Um, in terms of Schedule II Medicaid claims uh, for 2011. Uh, doctor in Fort Lee, no medical equipment in his office at all. That's a clue. Uh, just the desk. New patients had to pay $260 in cash. Uh, any, any visit after that was $130. And if you wanted an extra prescription while you were there, just in case you needed another month of Oxy, you could get an extra prescription for another $130. Um, this doctor was arrested in 2010, uh, $150,000 in cash in his house, mostly in 20s. <laughs> sounds like a drug dealer, I'm not going to say that he is, but it sounds, sounds like it. Um, the doctor in Atlantic City had a security guard to screen patients. Another clue. Um, the security guard would actually get prescriptions from the doctor and then hand them out to the patients. New patients had to be vouched for by an existing patient and cleared by the security guard. Uh, which is, you know, frustrating. You can't get somebody inside the doctor's office without an existing patient vouching for them. Um, and, they, and patients were told to bring an MRI with them, and if they didn't, they would have them put in the patient's file to, to give it some sort of legitimacy. Uh, this doctor in Camden wrote prescriptions for 10 kilograms of Oxy in a 19-month period, a street value of $10 million. 3,100 prescriptions for Schedule II drugs. And, and we have the, I couldn't bring a surveillance video, but if you can see the surveillance video of this doctor, uh, the, the day that the doctor's office was open, it was like a you know, street fair in front of the, in front of the doctor's office. Um, another doctor with organized crime connections saw one patient every six minutes on most days that we surveilled his office. I don't know how many, I can't get in to see my doctor in six minutes. I, you know. um, uh, this doctor was, literally, it was described as she was propped up in a chair. He was a, a, a fairly an older gentleman. Uh, no exam. He had a nurse who would essentially tell him what to write on the prescription pad, and I suspect she probably held his hand as he wrote the prescription. To him. Um, so it, it, I'm, I'm, I get, probably should apologize for making light of it a little bit, but, but these are sophisticated uh, drug distribution organizations in some cases. I mean, look, there are some doctors that are legitimately going to write more prescriptions for this, more prescriptions for this kind of medication than others. But um, when you're dealing with this type of investigation, uh, it, it, it's tricky. It's, it's not the typical model that, that traditional law enforcement is used to. And so what we tried to do was highlight some of those facts that you can look for and, and among other things, give, present some strategies for how state can change uh, the laws to, to make it tougher. So we made recommendations regarding uh, adopting prescription writing uh, uh, standards, uh, tougher penalties for diversion uh, on both the regulatory and the criminal side, and, 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 and recommended the appropriate use of those penalties. I mean, I agree that you can't arrest your way out of this problem, but there is a, there is a way for law enforcement to make a meaningful impact. Uh, we recommended that there be a state, statewide opiate task force uh, to assist in putting these cases together, uh, that there would be more, better oversight of how medical practices are run, uh, keep some of these organized crime figures out of the business, um, and, and, and a number of other recommendations. I can, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I, in terms of current trends, I actually have some good news to report. Um, two weeks ago, um, there was an assembly bill presented and a companion Senate bill uh, presented that adopted all but one of our recommendations. Um, I encourage you to, to, to look at that piece of legislation. If, if 
you know, as a take home, if there's something you want to do when you get home, look at it. See if it's something you can get behind. If it is, call your call your local legislator uh, and, and talk to them about it and, and, and see if they'll sign up. And, and that's the way to make a meaningful a meaningful uh, change here. And if you think it's not going on uh, in your town or, or whatever, and I, I suspect that no one here thinks that, but I, I noticed last night it's a case I've been following a former Madison, I'm from Chatham, New Jersey, a former Madison, New Jersey town councilman, he's, uh, this is the town next to us, who's also a medical doctor, pled guilty yesterday to conspiring to distribute the prescription painkiller oxycodone. Town councilman and the doctor in Madison, New Jersey. You know, um, so it, it, it's a changing...